a big part of what we're doing today is figurative. Liturgical. Uh, there is a lot of representation here today in this chapter that says one thing, but the meaning is totally different. Now, it's not a contradiction in the Word of God. You have to remember, this is a vision that has been staged before John the Apostle. And these are things that he is witnessing and seeing played out. There's a lot of sky drama in chapter 12 today. Uh, the next couple of weeks, today and next week, uh, will show a lot of sky drama and things that are going on that has a different representation. And I, when I explain it, you'll understand it. And then, of course, we have our Christmas service, so we will take a break from this, try to wrap this up around January, but uh, we'll have a Christmas message about what Christmas is all about. Uh, and it's uh, titled, The Christmas Surprise at Last. But anyway, today is the woman and the dragon. So we're going to go before the Lord in prayer and get this started. But before I do, I just simply want to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Since that was just a little under excitement, look to your neighbor and ask them, are you ready? All right, they're ready about as much as you are. All right then, hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we praise you. Father, now it is time for a portion of your word, the iron scepter, the authority of your word, the dedication of your word, the necessity of your word, and the application of your word. We thank you, God, for it has full authority, for it is sovereign, it is powerful, it is alive and well, and we praise you for it. It is the power of life and death, and what we speak and what we believe, who we are, what we are. So have your way in this house. Holy Ghost! Give the people of God the revelation, the impartation, and the illumination of the Word of God in their understanding that they would never, ever be the same again. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen and a glorious hallelujah. All right, we are at Revelations chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. And the Bible says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. And verse 6, The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. Now, we know 
that the 1260 days is also three and one half years. It is the last three and a half years of the tribulation. We are now stepping into the great tribulation. All hell has broke loose. All kinds of things have happened. We have seen in the last few chapters all the things that have been destroyed, people that have been killed, vegetation wiped out, uh, greenery, plants, plagues, all kinds of things have taken place because of people's rebellion to receive God. They have still cursed the name of God and refused to repent and believe. Also in the process of this, understanding that Satan emulates everything about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As we have the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, there is Satan and or the devil, the Antichrist, as well as the beast. There's the trinity of this darkness and evil. We have angels. We have seraphims and cherubims and seraphs and cherubs and so on and the order and structure of heaven. Satan has the same thing in hell. He has demonic angels that used to be angels of God until they were swept out of heaven and they pulled mutiny against God and followed Satan to the earth as they were cast down to the earth. God has established the family. Satan is trying to destroy the family. Everything that God is doing, Satan is coming back. It's kind of a positive to a negative. Satan is trying to destroy everything that God is doing. That is the only way Satan gets victory, is to accomplish his system, the world system, the evil system in this world, opposite of what God is doing. Destroying the family is his delight. Strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. Strike the head of the family. And without a godly woman persisting and not giving up, the family will scatter. They will be destroyed. And we're finding out that many, many are. They're choosing the wrong way of life. Some not caring, but some not fully understanding what is being brought against them and what's going to happen. And then when it does, it's going to be everlastingly, eternally too late for them to do anything about it. That's why the tribulation. We are completely pulled out of here. There's nothing left but evil. As 144,000 out of the tribulation will be saved. We'll be ministers of the gospel proclaiming the word of God to the very end while people are given a choice to receive the mark of the beast or to receive the glory of heaven by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then they will be suffering torment, punishment, brutal cruelty, and eventually killed because of their decision for Christ. And this is where we're at. So let us begin with the interpretation. A great and wondrous sign. Chapter 12 presents four great conflicts between God and Satan. Not all of them will be covered in today's message. Satan's conflict with Christ and his redemption, his work of redemption, is verses 1 through 5. Satan's conflict with the faithful of Israel, 
verse 6 as well as verses 13 through 16. Satan's conflict with heaven, verses 7 through 9. And number 4, Satan's conflict with believers, verses 10 and 11 and verse 17. We will cover some of this today. Remember, this is not in chronological order. This has been given the way John has been given the vision on the island of Patmos where after John took care of this vision, John was released from the island of Patmos as an old man sent back to Jerusalem where he lived out his old age before receiving heaven. Also where he penned 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Uh, and two of those he penned in bed on his back with people around him while he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ as John ministered to agnostics and diagnostics and the different sects of people that were there, Josephus records a time when John was repeatedly giving the message over and over. Josephus records where there was a time when John was asked, when are you going to change your message? In other words, when are we going to hear something else? We're ready for something different. And John's reply was, when you get it, I'll change it. And uh, I think that's about as good as it gets. Amen? When you get it, I'll change it. This woman, beginning the sky drama, this woman refers to the faithful of Israel. It is not a literal woman. Just like a lot of guys give their cars a name. And you guys know what I'm talking about. And most of the guys give their cars a name that is a woman's name. I used to have Big Bertha. Then it went into Martha, uh, the car. Then it changed later on as the car changed. It went from the bomb to the hoopty. But a lot of guys do that. This woman is the faithful of Israel. This is God's baby. This is God's people. This is God's prize. The apple of his eye. He cherished Israel. He is doing everything to restore his family back to the rightful owner, the Creator. This woman refers to the faithful of Israel through whom the Messiah, meaning the Christ child, verses 2, 4, and 5, came into the world, Romans 9, 5. Romans 9, 5, there's are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all and forever praised. Amen. This is indicated not only by the birth of the child, but also by the reference to the sun and the moon in Genesis 37, 9 through 11, and the 12 stars. Now remember the 12 stars which would naturally refer to the 12 tribes of Israel. Genesis 37, 9 through 11. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. And you will remember who this is the more I read. Listen, he said, I had another dream. 
And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. You know who it is yet? When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were outraged and jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Verse 2, the great and wondrous sign is literally the great wonder. John is still experiencing vision 2 and had returned to his heavenly viewpoint in Revelation 11.15 that says the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. John was given this vision in segments, in stages, being in a trance, while all of this is like a video recording that is actually running through his mind that he can see right there, played out right before his eyes. Amazing what God is doing and the miracle that has taken place. And the things that John is seeing and recording and the things that are blowing his mind that he is trying his best to articulate it and put it down. Things he's never seen before. Things that if it happened to you and I, we would have trouble pinning something we fully don't comprehend that we've never seen before. What do you call it? How do you describe it? This is what he's dealing with. This is why the vision with the description, the interpretation has variances because John is doing his best as he sees this woman before him that is actual, actually Israel. <clears throat> the heart of the matter of God. <clears throat> I have always said that God the Father, the head of the Trinity, and the Son, powerful, restoring the people back to His heavenly Father, His main job and focus. The Son, powerful in glory, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus couldn't do anything without the work of the Spirit. But if you read and study about the Holy Spirit, and I'm, I'm not trying to say something that you're going to think is a heresy or where did he get that? But the Holy Spirit has a lot of feminine qualities where a man could get angry and, and blow it or lose it. The spirit can be burdened, grieved, hurt. Eventually can be totally snuffed out. I've always said that reminds me a lot and listen, each, each guy has some femininity within him. Now, I'm not talking about you can't tell whether you're a boy or a girl. And I ain't talking about walking around like this. I'm just talking about the sensitivity. Maybe sharing tears at certain things. Something that has grabbed your heart and touched you. Every macho man has this within him. Now, many that are worried about their position in life and their manhood tries to stamp it out, cover it up, hide it. 
so nobody sees a more genuine soft side. But there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not saying a woman loves to see her man cry. But I'm just saying that a woman loves to see her man allow his true feelings to be displayed, to be put out there in front of her, to be vulnerable. And a woman loves to see that, that her man is real, as well as macho, as well as tough, whatever you want to call it, but also as well as soft. There used to be a song out, and I don't really listen to country music. It's not a fan of mine. But I believe the song was done by a woman, and I think the name of it was Daddy's Hands. And it talked about how strong and tough they were with discipline, but yet how these same hands were also loving and encouraging and lifting up and nourishing a family. And that's what God likes to see. Jesus had it. God definitely had it. And the Holy Spirit is it. As well as the Spirit can be tough. Tough love. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. What He sees begins in heaven, which here means in the sky. This is played out right before Him. It's like going to the movies, taking your tickets, setting down, and all of a sudden the big screen opens up, and here it is. In the sky, because of the reference to the sun, the moon, and the stars, it's as if the entire sky turns into a stage that unfolds a drama right before John's eyes. If you have ever seen a nightmare laser light show, a nighttime laser light show, you will understand something of this effect. The glorious woman clothed with the sun has been explained in many ways. She is the protagonist of this drama, meaning she is the absolute main figure. The Roman Catholics thought this must be the Virgin Mary, the Queen of Heaven. But this is no literal woman, like I told you. She is a sign, a sign woman, a person of storybook proportions. And I don't mean fictitious, let me finish. She exists throughout the ages of time. Her clothing suggests splendor and loyalty, obviously figurative. Since stars cannot be seen, remember I said, remember the stars. Since stars cannot be seen when the sun is out. How many of you have ever went outside in broad daylight with the sun out and seen all the stars? No, you can't. The sky woman was pregnant at the time of labor. The experience of natural childbirth generally included crying out in pain as she was about to give birth. All you women fully understand this. Who is the sky woman? The only answer that fits is the redeemed people of God as God sees them glorious and splendor. Only sporadically did Old Testament Israel appear splendid and complete. For example, in the days of David and Solomon. Only from time to time in the history of Christianity have God's people been acknowledged publicly as a mighty force for good. For example, in the days of the Reformation. The Reformation is the action or process of reforming an institution or a practice, such as the 16th century movement for the reform of abuses in the Roman Catholic Church, ending in the establishment of the Reformed and Protestant churches led by Martin Luther. 
it has been criticized for its teaching against the ordination of women to the priesthood, for financial corruption and embezzlement, for the handling of incidents of sexual abuse. It is the only organization that I know of that pedophilia, they can be served out in the Roman Catholic Church somewhere else without going to the pen. It's the only organization I know of that is powerful enough in this world, in history, and in the political arena that can discipline their own priests for ruining children's lives and can take them out of the parish and send them to a place to be rebirthed and at some point in time given another parish again. I've never seen anything like it. Have you? I didn't think so. They were notorious for simony, meaning the act of buying and selling ecclesiastical offices and pardons. If you had enough money, many people don't know this. The church leaders at that time lived lavishly and violated their vows. Priests were not properly trained. Martin Luther criticized every bit of this. Martin Luther also stated that the Pope himself had too much power over the church and over politics. Also, Martin Luther's belief in justification by faith led him to question the Catholic Church's practices of the sale of indulgences or spiritual privileges by the clergy. He objected not only to the church's greed, but Martin Luther also did not believe the Catholic Church had the power to forgive sins and pardon sins. That was only done by God. On January the 3rd in the year 1521, Pope Leo X issues the Papal Bull Deset, the Romanian Pontificum which excommunicates Martin Luther from the Catholic Church. Now is why we have the Reformation churches, the ecclesiastical churches, the Protestants, many of the evangelical churches. Thus, John and we meet the first character in the sky drama, Chapter 12, verse 3 and 4, the second character is the antagonist, an enormous red dragon. Several ancient cultures had stories about dragons. The sky dragon, John saw, had seven heads and seven crowns. These are royal crowns, diadems, rather than victor's crowns, such as the woman wore. Diadems are jeweled crowns or headbands worn as a symbol of sovereignty and royalty. The only other diadem crown figure in Revelation are the ten crowned water monster, the Antichrist. In chapter 13, verse 1, and the multicolored king of kings, or the multi-crowned king of kings in chapter 19, verse 12. The seven heads suggest complete wisdom, God's perfect number, seven. Represents complete wisdom. The seven crowns point to the blasphemous kingly claims the ten horns means total power. Daniel had a vision of the powerful single-headed ten-horned beast in Daniel chapter 7, verse 7 and verse 20. Who is the sky dragon? He too exists throughout the ages of time. Verse 9 will clearly identify him as the devil. As God sees him throughout the ages, he is a vile dragon. In verse 4, John sees an illustration of his power. With a single mighty swish, his tail swept the third of the stars out of the sky, which is a third of the angels. John also sees a repulsive example of the dragon's hatred. He stood in front of the woman so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. 
throughout the ages, the drama God announced in Genesis 3.15 has been unfolding. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. During the days of Jesus' earthly life, the devil struggled to stamp him out. Is evident both through Herod's slaughter of the Bethlehem babies when the firstborn would die all over the land and the crucifixion when the devil thought he had total victory until one drop of Jesus' blood hit the firmament and he knew then that was his major mistake. 12 verses 5 and 6 the last two this morning. The third character is the sky drama. It is the woman's son, the hero of this drama. As the child born from, as the child born from the ideal people of God, this shows Jesus from a human race viewpoint. He came to the fullness of time from the stock of Israel, Galatians 4, 4 through 7. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, that's all of us, sons and daughters, God has made you also an heir to everything heaven has to offer. That! is great news. Give him praise in the house. Moreover, he is the main child who will rule the nations with an iron scepter who has existed from before the ages. The iron scepter with which the boy child will shepherd the wayward nations is mentioned in Revelations three times. Here, also in chapter 2, 27 and chapter 19, verse 15. Just as God always sees His people collectively and ideally as the sun-clothed woman, remember Israel. And because of Isaiah 53, we have been grafted into the family of God, Isaiah 54. We are now a part of Israel. We are a part of the family of God. We are no longer on the outside looking in. We're on the inside being able to check everything out. Because as Gentiles and as, fa as the family of God, we are entitled to everything heaven has to offer. Just as God always sees His people collectively and ideally as the sun-clothed woman, so He always sees her son ideally as the King of Kings snatched up to God, to His throne, and destined to rule the nations. Many students of this passage have been distressed by the lack of reference to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, those that didn't fully understand what was taking place. This simply underscores that this unfolding drama is not really about historical particulars. Also, it bothers some that the ascension of Jesus seems to be presented as the means God used to keep him out of the devil's clutches. Well, what do you expect? God said, I will put no more on you than you can bear. And I will always provide you a way out so that you can stand up under it. Amen? No different here. Wasn't the ascension a demonstration of his victory over the devil? Sure it was. Again, John is seeing a theatrical production. He's not writing a systematic theology. The point is that God saw to it that the woman's son was snatched up. Paul used the same verb to describe believers caught up to meet the Lord at his coming. 1 Thessalonians 4, chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. That says, and this is every one of us, that are believers. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so we will be with the Lord forever. And then it tells us, Therefore, encourage each other with these words as the day is approaching. we got every reason to be happy, excited, that what we are going through will, by God, come to pass. We are glory bound. Many interpreters see the 1260 days mentioned here as a flashback to the entire church age, just as a previous chapter flashed back to Christ's original coming to earth. We see the 1260 days, however, as a reference to the great end time persecution when believers will need God's protection even more. Revelations 11.3 identified this final time, however long it lasts, as one powerful witness and protection for the church prophetic. John sees the same thing represented dramatically by the woman fleeing into the desert to a place prepared for her by God. Keep in mind that this is still a sky drama. This should not be interpreted as a real place on earth. It symbolizes protection, just as the sealing of the 144,000 in chapter 7, 1 through 4. In fact, both the sealing of the 144,000 and the fleeing of the woman, Israel, to a solitary place are different ways of describing the same biblical truth. Got it? Let's bring this to a close. God sees to it that His people are spared the experience of His wrath, especially in the final time of troubles before the end. Of course, as the end of chapter 12 makes it painfully clear, this does not mean that God's people are spared the wrath of the devil. It means that all of those that received Christ during the tribulation are still going to have hell to pay. They should have received Him on this side of the rapture. Amen? So, those that receive Him are still tortured, punished, and eventually beheaded for the gospel of Jesus Christ. In those verses, then we receive the first part of the answer to the question, why is the consummation necessary? The answer, because the devil has always abhorred God's redeemed people and has tried to ruin God's plan for Christ's rule since the beginning. The consummation, the point at which something is complete and finalized, will end this state of affairs forever. You are not going to want to be there. Every eye closed and every head bowed. Acts chapter 16, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You have to believe. You have to repent. You have to ask. You have to receive. And you have to accept. Now, I believe every one of us in here is a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. Glory to God. But in case there's one that is undecided, unsure, feels they need to rededicate, come back to their first love, I'm going to pray this prayer, and you pray with me, and then Brother Darren will come and do, close us in prayer. Lord Jesus, Lord, I am still in need of your help, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, I want to belong to you, but I want to feel that confidence. I want to feel that security. I want to feel that, that I may struggle in life, but it doesn't mean my place has been removed. It doesn't mean that I've lost my position. It just means that the devil tries to trick me and that I don't need to fall for his scheme or his plan for my life. I need to follow God's plan, your plan, Lord. But if there's one here that doesn't know you today, Lord, I repent of everything I have ever done wrong. I am in need of your son's salvation because he went to the cross for me. 
He paid my debt that I couldn't pay, and he laid on that cross willingly to provide for me everlasting, eternal life. And I'm opening up my heart and my life right now, and I receive it today, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. Also, Lord, for the ones that feel they need to repent today and to receive a fresh and a new to come back to their first love, to fall in love with you like they did at first, God, and to receive that joy and that feeling of how good it feels to be a part of the family of God, knowing that on this earth, as hard as it is, my home is in heaven. This ain't my home. And I'm going to get to come home, and I'm going to get to come home soon, and I praise you for it now in Jesus' name. If there's one here that has received Lord, has received Jesus as Lord and Savior, would you just raise your hand where you sit? All right. Is there, if there's one here that has rededicated their life or just come back to their first love, that you've struggled in your walk with the Lord, but you haven't lost your salvation, you're still a part of the family, but you just feel like that you're not worthy. But you are. And that grace and mercy allows you to repent, dust yourself off, and come home to your first love. If you've done that today, would you just raise your hand where you said, Oh, I see it. Praise God. Praise God. Isn't it good that He allows us that opportunity? Yeah, And isn't it good that maybe some friends and family may hold what we do against us, but God never will. God said, I cast it as far as the east from the west, never to remember it again. Glory to God. All that is precious. Amen, amen, amen. You may raise up. Brother Darren, would you come, sir, and close us in prayer? I have had an absolute marvelous time preaching this word today. Oh, my gosh. It has blessed me. What God has done for me, there's no way that I could ever complain. He is so good to me. He's so faithful. And listen, as much as He loves me, so does He you. And, and we are the pride of Israel. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Amen? Now act like it. You got every reason in the world to be prideful in a good way, not a, not a puffed up way. And you got every reason in the world to encourage people that if you belong to him one day soon, we're leaving this old nasty world and we're coming home. Amen. That's where we're going. Praise God. Family, thank you for allowing me to do what I love to do more than anything. I am a blessed man beyond measure. I love you. God loves you. And the most important thing is Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today. We got a lot of family that are out sick. Keep them in prayer. And uh, fellowship meal is not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. Uh, it's going to be a regular fellowship meal, but let's bring some good food, sit down and eat, and have a great time. Amen. Uh, brother.